Praise the Lord. You can go ahead and open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I don't know what it is about this house. I always bring Romans to you. So that's a good pattern, right? Amen. Amen. The book of Romans, uh, definitely my favorite. Well, I wouldn't say it's my favorite. It's one of my favorite books in the Bible. I love the book of Romans. Uh, it's the ABCs of the gospel, right? It's the most explained book in the gospel of, of the gospel that we have. I thank God for the book of Romans. Um, so the book of Romans chapter 5, we're going to be reading verses 3 through 5 tonight. Verses 3 through 5. And uh, we'll go ahead and just read that passage. It's a short passage, so it won't take us long. And not only so... But we glory in tribulations. Now, I don't know about you, but I find it hard to glory in tribulations. But I want you guys to know something tonight. That there's a cause for glorying in tribulation. There's a reason to glory in tribulation. We're going to look at that tonight. There is a good reason to glory in tribulation. And so we glory in tribulations also. Knowing this, that tribulations worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and the hope maketh not ashamed. I want to read that again. This tribulation, this trial, this temptation, this persecution that you might find yourself in tonight, when you come out of it, it will not leave you ashamed. That's good news. That's good news. When you come out of what you're going through, you're not going to be ashamed. It maketh not ashamed because the love of God, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, Amen. which is given unto us. Like we've said already, the presence of the Lord is here because the Holy Spirit has been given unto us. The Holy Spirit now abides and dwells within us. In this life, it is guaranteed that we're going to face many mountains. We're going to face many valleys. We're going to face many hard times, many t trials, many temptations, many tribulations of all different stripes and of all different varieties. You can count on it. It seems to be that with life, you're either crawling out of a valley or you're entering into the valley. It seems to be that with life we spend more time in the valley than we do on the mountaintop. But I tell you today that that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Amen. You're going to find out that it's in the valley. That's where we grow. Yes. How many of you know that you need to grow tonight? Yes. I need to grow tonight. And it's in the valley. It's in the trial. It's in the tribulation. It's in the temptation where we learn to grow. This is what God's got you here for. Whatever season of life you may find yourself in, whatever it is that's trying you, whatever it is that's testing your faith, whatever it might be, it's for the purpose of causing you to grow. Amen. So I tell you tonight, and I'm, I proclaim it according to the scriptures, I proclaim it according to the authority of the word of God, glory in your tribulation. Yes. Give God glory yes. in the midst of your tribulation. I want you to know tonight that the reason that you will be glorying in tribulation is because it's come not to kill you. It's come not to destroy you. It's come not to tear you down. It's come not to eliminate you. But this trial, this temptation, this season of persecution and, fa and fa maybe failure has come for your good. It's come for your good. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him for His help tonight. Heavenly Father, we come to You right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, in that mighty name, Lord, the name above every other name, the name of Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank You. We thank You for the blood that was shed on Calvary, that we're no longer lost and condemned in our sin, but we've been blood-bought, washed, and born again, and we're saved and we know You, Lord. I thank You. Lord, I thank You for each of these in this room tonight. I ask God that they would walk out of here encouraged, 
that they would walk out of here strengthened, built up in their most holy faith, ready to take on whatever trial, whatever temptation, whatever tribulation that might face them in this coming week. Lord, I just ask that your hand would be upon them and that you lift them up above the shadows, Lord, and cause their feet to walk on higher ground. And Lord, we thank you. We ask for your anointing. Lord, we give way to the Holy Spirit tonight that he would come, that he would teach and that he would preach and that he would disciple your people. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, for what you're going to do tonight. We give you praise. We say it in Jesus name. Amen and amen. The background of the book of Romans, we you probably know it very well. So we won't spend a lot of time in that. Paul is is the writer. And you know that the Apostle Paul is a, a man who God would reveal the new covenant to. It tells us in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 12 that he knew a man about 14 years ago who received an abundance of revelation. God, was, uh, God chose this man, God chose the Apostle Paul that he might reveal the new covenant in him. And the book of Romans is just that. The book of Romans is the detailed explanation of the new covenant. That's what you have in the book of Romans. That, that's what we study. And the last time we were together, I ran you through this, but uh, to stir up your pure minds to remembrance, I'll do it again. Uh, for verse, uh, chapters 1 through 3, we're looking at uh, really what and mostly, it actually kind of divides in chapter 3. So the division really only goes part way through chapter 3, but we're dealing with the idea that all men are guilty before God. Not just the unsaved Gentile, the wicked Gentile, but also the religious Jewish sector. So even the religious men and the, and the, uh, the unredeemed alike, the men who never knew God, never truly knew the true God, uh, they're all condemned and guilty before God. None, there are none who are righteous. There are none who seek after God. No, not one. All men are guilty before God. And that's what we get in, in, uh, ver in chapters 1 through chapter 3. And then in chapters 4 through chapter 5, God reveals to us, which is our major section that we're going to be talking about tonight, God reveals to us that we've been justified by faith. Praise God. Thank God for that. Amen. Thank God that it's not by our works. Amen. If it were by works, we'd all stand condemned. Amen. We'd all stand guilty before God. But God designed a plan. <laughs> God made a way. Amen. God had a design for His redemption plan revealed to us in the Son of Jesus Christ and manifested to us now through the new covenant that we have right here. The book, the Bible, the Word of God. We see the new covenant detailed intricately for us to study and for us to know. And then in chapter 6 through chapter 8, he moves into sanctification again by faith. See, this life is by faith. The just shall live by faith. The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It's all about faith. It's not about your performance. It's not about your ability. It's not about your do-goodisms. It's about your faith. How pure is your faith? So sanctification by faith. And then in uh, chapters 9 through 11, we're instructed, hey, don't forget what you just learned. Don't be found like Israel of old and fail to enter into the rest that God's provided for his people and choose to, un to not believe what has just been revealed to you. But walk in the light of that which I have just instructed you in. And he gives us that. And then he teaches us how to live. Simple practicality. The simple everyday as we live kind of thing. Paul reveals us to that in chapters 12 through 16. And that's the breakdown of Romans. I mean, we're talking about the most detailed account of the new covenant. And here, right in the midst of this explanation of justification by faith, really it's Paul's thesis. It's the climax that he's been coming to in, uh, in uh, verses 1 through 2. It says, knowing we are, we are justified by faith. That's what he comes to, this conclusion. We've been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And could you go to the next verse real quick? By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice. Look at this. And rejoice in hope of the glory of God. That word rejoice, we see it three times in this, in this one chapter alone. So Paul's wanting us to know something. And this is the reason. Now that he's convinced you. 
Now that he's convinced you that you are justified by faith. He gave us the testimony of Abraham. The testimony of David. He has convinced us and he's proven to us that no man is ever justified by his ability or his do-goodisms or his religiosity. But he is justified simply by his faith. Amen. Amen? But then as we go through chapter 5, Paul's going to do something that kind of throws you off, off balance a little bit. He's got to bring up sin again in chapter 5. And he'll bring up sin again. And he'll begin to deal with sin that sin entered in by one man. But the righteousness of God has come by another man. And he starts to give us this contrast between sin entering in through Adam. And we know that sin was even before the law because we know that men died. So as long as men have died, sin has been present. Sin has been working in the hearts and lives of men even before the law, which simply defined sin for us. But even before that, sin was reigning in the hearts of men because people died. So because people died, we know that sin reigned. So he's bringing up sin again. Why does he have to bring up sin again? Well, Romans chapter 6, he's going to have to teach us sanctification by faith. He's going to have to reveal to you that your problem today, even though you're justified by faith, even though you are saved, even though you truly are uh, kept by the power of God, and that what you do uh, will never uh, cause you to walk out of his hand, but it will only be if you quit believing, but that his faith and his grace is powerful enough to keep you. It's powerful. The grace of God has power. Yes. It truly does. I mean, this is the power of God we're talking about. Yes. This yes. is the working and the operation of God. That's what grace is. Grace isn't just some uh, term that's talk, that talks about the goodness of God, but it's the goodness of God at work in you. That's what grace is. It's not just His goodness, but it's His goodness working in you. Yeah. Grace is the power of God. That is the, what it really is, grace. That is the moving and the operation of the Holy Spirit in your heart and in your life. That's what grace really is. And you can't earn it. It's undeserved. It's, it's given to you as a gift, the grace of God. Yeah. And He has to bring up sin again. Because He's got to teach you that sin is still your issue. The sin nature is still the problem. This is still something you're going to have to deal with even after this. But before Paul goes into all of that, he wants you to know something. In Romans chapter 3, in Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through, uh, 3 through 5, he wants you to know that you can glory in your tribulations. He wants you to know that there are going to be, there are going to be difficulties, trials. There are going to be coming many stripes of many different varieties, but you can glory in them. You don't have to fear them because they've not come to destroy you. What's a tribulation? What is tribulation? Tribulation is simply this. I say simply, but it's quite uh, difficult uh, to go through. Originally, it expressed sheer physical pressure on a man. That's what tribulation is. It's, it's intense physical pressure. That's what uh, tribulation actually means. And it's a strong term. Uh, which does not refer to minor inconveniences, but to real life hardships. We're not talking about uh, you got cut off in, in the line at Walmart. That's not what we're talking about. Now, for some people, that is a real life tribulation. That's, <laughs> that's painful. That's hurting. But, um, but that's not what we're really dealing with. We're talking about things that come to destroy your faith. We're talking about things that have come to destroy your faith. Tribulations. And the illustration is best seen in uh, Gethsemane. Gethsemane literally means olive press. Now, um, that, is, uh, th that was a field, that was a, an olive garden, uh, and it's referred to as the olive press. So what, what they would do in that day is that they, would, they had a press, and they would put the, it's as simple as it sounds, but they would put the olives in it, and they would put extreme pressure against it so that they would press out every bit of the olive oil that they could get. That's what tribulations and temptations and trials are putting you through. You're in the olive press. And it was the olive press of Gethsemane is best pictured with Jesus Christ. As he laid in the, in, in the, uh, in the olive press, he said that um, he began to be very sorrowful and very heavy. That's what Jesus said. 
That's what is recorded about Jesus while he was in the Garden of Gethsemane shortly before his crucifixion. He was very sorrowful and very heavy. It was very heavy, the burden of what was about to take place, the tribulation, the trial that had come against him. Listen to this. It was so heavy that the Gospels tell us that he sweat great drops of blood. Great drops of blood. Our friend here has just come from a baseball game probably or practice, probably sweated a little bit. But he didn't sweat blood. Amen. Right? All of you have sweated. We've worked hard. You've, you've done something that's caused you to sweat. But probably very few of us have ever sweat blood. But Jesus was so pressed beyond measure that his body literally began to produce sweat. And it's not, it, the idea of this is, it's not just little drops of blood, but thick clotting of blood that would push through his pores. My friends, we don't know temptation and trial like that. Thank God He took that for us. Thank God He bore the weight of that for us. The sin of humanity pressing against Him at this time. Thank God He bore that. But that's what we see. And if the description isn't, isn't as clear in the King James uh, of that agony in the garden as it should be. But it literally pictures Christ probably in a picture we don't quite see Him. But He was literally staggering. From one place of prayer to the next. I mean, we're talking about a weight that was upon him. So heavy that it caused him to literally stagger in his physical stature. And we're talking about a man who has no sin in him. No sin to be found in him. But so pressed by this tri tribulation that he would have to face. That it literally caused him to stagger the Son of God would stagger all over and sweat great drops of blood, pressed very heavy. That's what a tribulation is. It's come to press you. It's come to put weight on you. That is why it is there. It has come to press you. It has come to weigh upon you. And we may say, oh, well, uh, we don't have to ever have to have anything weighing upon us. Yes, you do. You have to be pressed. You have to be tried. You have to go through something. You have to experience the weight of tribulation. You need to feel you need to have these things. Why? Because tribulation is going to reveal some things about yourself that you did not know was there. Amen. Amen. You couldn't have even imagined that these things might be in you. Ever had one of those revelations? Mm -hmm. Could have never even imagined that I had to deal with that. But that's why the tribulation came. I didn't know it was there. But he had to show me it was there. Because if he doesn't show me what's there, I'll never deal with what's there. Yeah. And if that's allowed to continue to grow in me, eventually it's going to cause a whole lot more problem than it did when he revealed it to me behind the curtain. So thank God that He does show us. So tribulation is important. The pressing is important. It's necessary. You need this. Tribulation is something that you need. So we're talking about anxiety and pressure that's come to rob your faith. It's come to steal your faith. But it's necessary for it to be there because there are things in you that will steal your faith if not dealt with. Yes. <laughs> that's good. Amen. There are things inside of your own heart that will corrupt your faith until it no longer exists. It's only leavened. Amen. See, so we have to have tribulation. We have to have trial. We have to have temptation. And it's good news. It's not bad news. Tribulations and trials are not bad news. I know we think of them that way because they hurt when they come. And I'm not trying to sit here and tell you that I love my trials and my temptations. I, I have a hard time rejoicing in my pain. I do. I'll be honest. But I, I'm learning something right now. Paul's teaching me something right now. He's planting a truth in my heart that these tribulations, these trials haven't come to kill me. They haven't come to destroy me, but they've come to, to literally change me into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And fill me with His power Amen. to purify my faith. I don't need more faith. I need pure faith. Yeah. 
I don't need, I don't need a, a higher amount of faith. I need a faith that's pure and as genuine as the size of a mustard seed. And if I have faith that's as pure and as genuine as a mustard seed, my God can use us. My God can use this church to move this city. Amen. If you have faith, the size of a mustard seed, God can use each and every one of you to move this city. To turn this city upside down for his gospel. Go out and trouble this area. Just like they did in the book of Acts. Go turn this city upside down. All it takes is faith the size of a mustard seed. Turn your school upside down with the gospel. Turn your job upside down with the gospel. Turn the marketplace upside down with the gospel. Amen. Do it. Because all you need is faith the size of a mustard seed. And tribulation has come to teach you, to grow you, and to purify that faith. So it's a good thing. And it says that we can rejoice in this. My God said, it, Paul, if Paul said this, it's in the canon of Scripture, that must mean that I can do it. <laughs> Philippians tells me that uh, it is Him that worketh in you both the will and the to-do of His good pleasure. So He doesn't just plant the desire in my heart, but He fills me with a power to accomplish that desire. So if He says rejoice in tribulation, He's going to supply you with the power of the Holy Spirit to rejoice in tribulation. Amen. This is for you tonight. Yes. This is for me tonight. I can take joy in my tribulation. Literally, that means to take pride in something. That's what this literally means. Take pride in your tribulation. Take pride in your tribulation. It means to boast over a privilege of possession. You can boast because you're possessing a tribulation. This is what Paul's saying. You can literally boast and walk in... <laughs> not in your own pride. Okay, that's ugly. Nobody wants to see that. But you can walk in the confidence of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes. That's the pride is talking about. That means to me that I don't have to walk around in my trial, my tribulation, my, my, uh, my, my pain and my heartache with my head hung down. Slothing around like I'm <laughs> crawled out from behind a rock. But I can walk confidently like I'm a clothed general. In God's army. And I don't have to walk in fear. I don't have to walk in doubt. I don't have to walk in this unbelief. But I can walk confidently in pride. Knowing that I'm possessing a tribulation. And I'm going to teach you why you can walk that way. I'm going to tell you tonight why you can walk that way. You can literally walk tall in your tribulation. I want you to get this. I pray you get this tonight. You can walk tall in your tribulation. You can walk tall with your head held high, with joy in your heart, yes. in your tribulation. Yes. How many of you are going through something right now? <laughs> Just raise your hand. <laughs> you can walk tall in it. You got a family member not saved? Raise your hand. You can believe God for it. That can be a trial and a tribulation at times. You believe God. You can walk tall in it. You can walk tall in it. So can this really be? Can we really do this? I mean, does Paul really know what he's talking about? Yes, he does. The Holy Spirit does. Does Paul know though? Has Paul experienced this? Has Paul been through this? Has Paul had to deal with this? Has Paul had to have this revealed in him? The Apostle Paul. Does he really know what he's talking about? Yes, he does. Yes, he does. I'm sure it's easy for us to think that the Apostle Paul, and we exalt him greatly at times. Great man of God. Thank God for him. But he had to walk the same walk I have to walk. Amen. He had to go through some of the same things that I'm going to have to go through. And the Apostle Paul, let's see if he knows what he's talking about. The Apostle Paul rejoicing in tribulation. I want to bring uh, a story to you. In his very first missionary journey. You know what? Let's go even further back. You know what? When he first got saved, you know what he did? He went into Damascus and he began to preach. You know what happened to him? The governor of the whole region got mad at him and decided he was going to kill him. 
And said the garrisons, I'm talking about three years after being saved. Three years. Three years he's done made the whole region so mad that they're ready to kill him. He has to be let down the window through a basket. So does Paul know what we're talking about? Yeah. Has he been through something? Paul gets to Jerusalem right after that. And you can imagine the elation in his heart. He's finally going to meet with the, uh, the brothers and the sisters in Christ who walked with Jesus. He finally gets to meet Mark. He fi or, I'm sorry, Matthew. He finally gets to meet Peter. He gets to meet James and John and the other 12 and, and all the others who might have been there uh, with Christ at his ascension and even at the day, the day of, the, of, of Pentecost. And he walked with him even prior to that. The very people who walked with Jesus. Paul gets to go meet with them. And you know what happens when he gets there? <laughs> Don't nobody think he's saved. Right. Bad grammar, good preaching. <laughs> nobody thinks he's saved. They think this is a ploy. What you're trying to do is trick us into believing that you're actually saved so that we'll take you to where all the Christians are grouping up together and you're going to slaughter all of us. That's what they thought. So they won't even let Paul join in with them. But Paul's a hard-headed man. You know what he does? He goes into a temple. And he begins to pray. And the Lord speaks to him and he says, you're going to have to go. Because the people here, they're not going to receive your testimony of me. As found in Acts chapter 22. They're not going to receive your testimony of me. So you're going to have to leave. You're going to have to get out. But see, he had already started a huge fuss even without having to hear that from the Lord. Because he went back to the very synagogue that he would have been working out of. And he began to tell them, hey guys, we got it wrong. Jesus is the Messiah. God. He's the Son of God. He appeared to me on my way to Damascus to persecute the Christians there. He showed up to me and he told me, Saul, Saul, why thou persecuted me? <laughs> it's hard to kick against the pricks. He said, Lord, what would you have me do? My God. And when he got there, do you know what Ananias came to tell him? You go tell him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, do we think Paul knows something about this issue that he's talking about? Has he been there? Been persecuted in uh, Damascus, run out of Damascus, comes to Jerusalem, nobody thinks he's saved, and then he starts telling all of the, his Jewish friends, all of his old friends, that Jesus was the Messiah, and they're ready to kill him. So they got to get him out of town quick. And then he goes away, and we don't even hear from him for about six years or so. Does Paul know what he's talking about? First missionary journey Paul went on. Do you know what he, what he had to go through? It says that he went through Iconium and he came into Syria, Antioch, and Iconium in that first missionary journey. And you know what happened? The Jews got so mad that they wanted to kill him again because he's preaching Jesus. The Jews want to kill him, so they start stirring up strifes. Paul and Barnabas hear about it and they get out of town. They leave and they go into uh, uh, Lystra and Dur. And these men from Syria, Antioch, and Iconium are so mad at Paul that they follow him through Lystra and Dur. And in Dur, they convince the men, hey, we should stone this guy and kill him because he teaches against the, the law. And Paul is stoned to what appears to be to death. Now, it just says that he appears he's dead. I'm not sure if he was dead or not. Maybe he was, but he was really beaten up. He just got stoned. They didn't use pebbles. They threw big rocks. He's been stoned to death. <laughs> I love this testimony. But God raises him up while the disciples stand among him. And you know what he does? He goes back into Derb. And you know what he goes from there? He goes into Lystra. You know where he goes from there? He goes back into Iconium. And then he goes back into Antioch. And he begins to preach to the very same place. Could you imagine? All right, so say I'm Paul. And you're the guys who just stoned me to death in, in Derb. And I'm walking into Iconium. Here I am. Walking into Iconium. Can you imagine what they must have thought? My, maybe he's a God. Yeah. yeah, could you imagine what they might have thought? But God raised him up. And he went right back there. Now, do we think Paul knows what he's talking about? 
Because he even went back to the very same places where the people killed him. Or almost killed him. So does he know what he's talking about? How about the Macedonian call? The Apostle Paul struggling to find where to go preach. And God calls, God gives him a dream, gives him a vision. And there's a man standing over in Macedonia said, come over to Macedonia and help us. And, God, and Paul immediately sets out to do so. And he arrives in Philippi, which was a city in, in Macedonia. And in Philippi, he begins to preach and to teach. And then there's this little girl who won't stop following him, talking about how God, he, uh, they preach Christ the Son of God. But she's demon possessed. He casts out the demon from this girl because he got irritated. That's what it literally says. He got irritated and he cast that demon out of that girl. And made everybody in that city mad. He gets brought before the council. They literally beat him with whips on his back. Put him in the stocks. One of the most painful positions for the human body to be held in. And they hold him there with stripes already on his back. And the Bible tells us that while he's in the midst of this, y'all got to get this tonight. While he's in the midst of this pain, while he's, he is in excruciating pain. And it says that all of a sudden as Paul's just in this pain and he's broken and he's hurting, it says that he began to pray. He started to pray. And then that prayer hit Silas. And Silas began to pray. And then all of a sudden, the presence of the Lord filled that room. And the presence of God filled their hearts, filled their minds, filled their lives. And they began to sing praises unto God. They began to sing praises unto God. He had just come in to Philippi to do what God had called him to do. And while he's doing what God called him to do, he got whipped, thrown in the stocks, and imprisoned. But yet Paul still starts to pray. And then Paul still sings praises unto to God. Does Paul know what he's talking about? Rejoice in tribulation. Rejoice in tribulation. Glory to God. And what about the very epistle he's writing? The very epistle he's writing, while he's writing it, he's in Corinth, of 58 AD, roughly, 57 AD. And the Jews don't want him there either. How about Jesus? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before him. You need to get this tonight. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. For the joy. Think about this, my friend. He was about to endure agonizing suffering. I'm talking about the kind of death. It's the most violent, crucial kind of death that a man can experience. And the Bible tells us that he did it for the joy that was set before him. If Jesus is our example, we can joy in our tribulation. We can find rejoicing in our tribulation. Paul did it. Jesus, our great example, he did it. And then David, David says in Psalm 31, 7, I will be glad and rejoice in thy mercy, for thou hast considered my trouble. Thou hast known my soul in adversities. In Psalms 51, 8, he says, make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which you have broken may rejoice. Broken bones can rejoice. How many of you knew that? Broken, broken bones can cry out for joy. Mm, so can we joy? Can we rejoice? Can we, find, can we find the glory of God in our tribulation? The Bible says, yes, you can. Amen. Yes, you can. Glory to God. So why can we joy in tribulation? Tribulation is personified. Notice what it says in verse 3. It says, knowing Knowing that tribulation worketh. Tribulation is personified. Do you know what tribulation is? It's God's tool. What looked like it come to destroy you. Is a tool from God to save you. Yeah. <laughs> That's good news. Yeah, yeah. What looks like it came to destroy you. Is a tool from God coming to save you. Yeah. 
You know what? There's an example of that. And this one's for free. The disciples were told to go to the other side of the lake. You remember this story. Now, they were to go by themselves. Jesus was going to remain up in the mountain to pray. And he would come over and follow up with them. But he told them to go ahead. They were obedient and did so. But in the midst of that, a great storm comes up and begins to take, begin to take on water. This, and it's literally a hurricane is what they were experiencing. It began to take on water. And all of a sudden, in the midst of this storm, here comes what they perceive to be a spirit. They saw someone coming, and we think that when it says that in the King James, it is talking about the Holy Spirit, but it actually means a spirit. They thought it was a ghost. And they were fishermen. They knew what that meant. If a ghost is walking on the water, you better look out because he's coming to take you down. He's coming to take your life. He's going to swallow you up. <laughs> but he said, fear not, it is I. Amen. <laughs> they thought that that spirit was coming to destroy them, but it was Jesus Christ coming to save them. Amen. I'm just trying to tell you tonight, your tribulation hasn't come to kill you. It hasn't come to destroy you. It's come to save you. It's come to work the power of God into you. Yeah. Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Tribulation worketh. And he said, knowing that tribulation worketh. One of the biggest problems we have is that we just don't know. Or we forget what we have known. Yeah. Yeah. I need to be reminded of this. Because when I'm in the midst of tribulation, I forget that I can rejoice in it. But then all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will show up. There's going to be a moment in my tribulation where the Holy Spirit will show up and he will remind me, Paris, you've been sitting down in that miry pit for too long. This tri uh, tribulation, this trial, this temptation, I did not let this come your way for you to sit down in the mud like this. And the Holy Spirit will put a song in my heart. He'll give me a word from heaven. Uh, we sang it today in chapel. And I can't, I'm, the biggest smile comes on my face. It's almost, I can't control it when, this, when we sing this song. But it, it goes like this. I feel the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me. I feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. For the joy of the Holy Ghost is all over me. And then there's a section in it. It's, I think it's a bridge. I don't really know music well. But it starts to say, so it goes along like this. For I have been loosed. I've been set free. Pardon me a moment while I have a jubilee for the joy of the Holy Ghost is all over me. It was everything I could do this morning for not running all over that chapel. Everything within me. Lord, my God, I could feel it. And, and studying this out, knowing that this is what I was about to bring to you tonight. And that song to be sang this morning. My God, I can rejoice in my tribulation. Maybe this is just for me tonight. And if it's just for me, I'll take it. Because I need to know that I can joy in my tribulation. That I can walk confidently and pridefully in the in the Lord Jesus Christ that I'll make it through. This didn't come to kill me. It came to cause me to grow. I'm not going to die in this. I'm going to be saved in this. Glory to God. Glory. I want you to know it. I want you to feel it. I want it to get down. Jesus said, he said to his disciples when he talked to them about his death, he said, let this sink down into your ears. Well, I'm telling you tonight, let this truth sink down into your ears. You grab a hold of it. You possess it. Don't let it go, but let it walk out in you. Let it live in you. Let it move in you. Let it have its being in you. You can joy in tribulation. You don't have to walk in condemnation any longer. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. I feel the joy of the Lord falling fresh on me. I feel the joy of the Lord delivering me. Hallelujah. Glory be to the Lamb of God. Lord, we thank you, Lord. 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 Oh, yes, I feel the joy of the Lord. I feel the joy of the Lord. 
let this sink down into your ears. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Glory be to the Lamb yes. of God. Glory be to God. Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And the reason you can rejoice is this, is that tribulation is put to work on your behalf. <clears throat> that thing that's come to destroy you is working on your behalf. Oh, <laughs> uh, you can't lose. <laughs> You can't lose being a born again child of God. You can't lose. Amen. You're on the winning side. Amen. I'm not talking about a possibility of winning. Hallelujah. I'm talking about a side that's already won. Amen. I'm talking Amen. about the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> 2,000 years ago, He said it is finished. Amen. And that meant that it is finished forever. He paid the price for my sin, my tribulation, my illness, my pain. He did it for me 2,000 years ago. Nothing need be added to it. Nothing need be done again. It's finished. It's done. That's it. Wrap it up. Glory to God. Glory to God. It is finished. <laughs> I feel the presence of God. I thank God for what He's doing tonight. It means it works on your behalf. Literally put to work. Jeremiah said this. He said, For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years, this is Jeremiah 29 and 10. For thus saith the Lord, after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word to you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you. They are thoughts of peace and they are not of evil to give you an expected end. God had allowed captivity to come upon Israel to teach them something. To cause their hearts to return to Him. And He said that after that 70 years is completed, there is... <laughs> There is an ending point in this trial that you are in. Yes. There is a conclusion. Whatever it is that you're thinking about right now, that trial that's burdening your heart, there is an end to it. Amen. It will come to a conclusion. Amen. Amen. And at the conclusion, Jesus, the Word says, what, what God prophesied here in Jeremiah says, I will, I will show up to you. And I'm going to perform my good word, which I have put in your heart. Amen. He is going to do it. He is going to do it. That good word that he's placed in your heart, he will perform it. And he'll cause you to return. That speaks of reconciliation. Whatever it is that might be broken, it shall be reconciled. My God, we can glory in tribulation because it's for our good. And I just want to run through it real quick because it works patience. There's a Greek word for patience. It's called hupomone. And if you're like me, you'll never forget it. Hupomone. It's catchy. It just sticks with you. Hupomone. But that, that word patience, I think we, we miss it. Because in the Greek, it says a lot more than just being patient. Because being patient, you think about that. Well, I'm just being patient sitting here. No, no, that's not what it's talking about. It's talking about persevering. Yeah. So this tribulation is producing perseverance in your heart. That's what God's putting in you. So that you might persevere through this. He's not going to remove the tribulation. He's going to give you the perseverance to travel through it. You want to know why He's going to give you that perseverance? That hupomone? That ability to face anything? That ability to stand standfastly and unflinchingly as you're in the middle of the warfare? The, the fiery darts are flying past you. You can hear them whizzing by you. You hear the bombs going off to your left and to your right. But you stand steadfast, unflinched. That's hupomone. That's what He's given you. Hupomone. That you can stand in the midst of that trial. 
Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured, that's hupomone, persevered through. He hupomone, the cross. It's not the picture of grinding your teeth, just gutting it through it, or gritting through it. No, it's hupomone goes far beyond that, my friends. It means that you can stand just like this in the middle of a battle zone with joy in your heart, joy on your face, joy all through you. <laughs> As the bombs are going off all around you, you don't have to fear them because God has given you hupomone. Yes. That tribulation is working in you. Hupomone. Stand your ground. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 6, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Yes. It means put your foot down. You ever had to do that with your kids? I don't know this yet. <laughs> I'm sure some of you do. You got to put your foot down. That's not happening. But that's what it means. It means that you can firmly put your feet down in the midst of that battle zone and stand. Amen. And stand. You want to know why? What, what's what's going to happen after that? It means that after you've been sat there in that fire and the battle's over, the tribulation has come to its conclusion, that you'll have experience. Now that word also is not seen very well. It means proven character. So you just won't have experience, but you'll have a proven, authenticated... Yeah. You know what's on trial? Your faith. Yeah. So your faith, when it comes through, it's going to be said to be proven, authenticated. <laughs> the real McCoy. Yeah. None of that fake gold stuff. This is the real stuff. Amen. Bite it. It'll break your tooth. Amen. This, I'm, I'm not sure what kind of texture gold should have. But, <laughs> but that gold's pure. Your faith will be pure. Yeah. See, this is why you glory. <laughs> this is why you glory. Because your faith can stand in the fire and it will be more pure when it comes through the fire. This is why you glory. And it says that after you have stood in the fire, come out authenticated, that's going to produce in you a hope. <laughs> that's going to give you hope. Joyful expectancy. Hope is, faith is the substance of things hoped for. This is knowing that what you can't see, can't touch, can't feel is going to come. Right. Amen. <laughs> it's what you can't see, can't touch, can't feel. That's coming my way. Yeah. What God promised me. I've stood through the fire. I've come through proven and my character, my faith is pure. Now that which I've been expecting to come is going to come my way. It gives you hope. Glory to God. And you know what it says next? It says, hope maketh not ashamed. My God, you will never be ashamed of putting your foot down in the midst of the war and standing there and allowing God to bring you through proven. You'll never be ashamed of this. <laughs> Let me tell you why. The love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is Amen. given unto us. Yeah. You won't be ashamed. You'll be full of His love. You're not going to be sad that you experienced or went through what you went through, what you experienced. That's not going to make you sad. It's going to make you to rejoice and to have a joyful expectancy because God's going to fill you to overflow. Literally, that word shed abroad, it's like the Niagara, my friends. His love being poured into you, overflowing to where it literally is so inside of you, it overflows into those around you. Amen. <laughs> this is what God's going to do for you. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Amen. This is good news. This is the word of God. This is the promise of God that you can stand. You can rejoice in your tribulation because it's going to work the glory of God into your heart and into your life. You can stand with me tonight.